Great. Well, well, thank you so much, uh, and uh, thanks for putting together such a great session, Drs. Bach and Dr. Wadden, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak. Um, to close out this session, we'll be talking about some real-world uh, MRI safety events and, and what we've done about them. Uh, an alternate title for this talk could be some some of us learn from the mistakes of others, and the rest of us have to be the others. So what I've learned is that it's, it's always helpful to learn what can go wrong and try to examine uh, your own shop and if uh, you might be a setup for a similar thing. I have no disclosures, and the purpose of this talk is to describe several MRI safety events, the root cause analyses, and the resulting practice changes that, that we put into place. Now, this is a little bit melodramatic, I, I admit, but uh, many people have said that our working conditions every day are almost like the perfect storm. We have ongoing MRI uh, faster workflows. You know, we're always looking at the bottom line. Our systems now are so incredibly complex. Our health records are complex. We have very complex patients with more and more implanted devices. And we can sum this all up, and you can really think that there's an increased likelihood of more and more MRI safety accidents. Now, when we look at these incidents, we have to realize that despite the best intentions of everybody, you might know every procedure uh, frontwards and backwards, but we're all humans, and we are all subject to human error. And th that's just the human condition. And what, ha what the problem is, is that to be smart about it, we need to try to put in protective barriers that basically protect the patient from our own innate uh, tendency to make human errors. And the problem comes in is that when these protective barriers themselves have holes in them, and then the, the planets align or the Swiss cheese holes align, and something bad can get through and, and get to our patients. So what I'm going to do here, I'm not going to do all these, uh, but we're going to go through several events that, that we've had and some that have been uh, given to me anonymously, uh, some projectile incidents, things related to the environment, patient care issues, and some things related to devices, and we'll wind up there. So let's start with something real basic, a uh, projectile uh, incident that we had. Uh, at our shop at, at Mayo Clinic, we have an internal uh, event reporting system that we do online, and uh, that's been very valuable to know about what's going on in the department. So what, what happened here, uh, this event starting from the top, uh, ferromagnetic stylet was not removed from an MR exam table after an intubation. It was hidden amongst the sheets, the scout was performed, and the tech saw some metallic blowout. Tech went in the room, moved the patient a little bit, um, moved them slightly, and then the stylet became a projectile zinging past her ear and flew into the magnet and thankfully didn't hit her. So there was, there was no injury. But when we looked back on this and did a root cause analysis of what happened and started looking at the situations that's, that were set up here, there were some new anesthesia personnel in, in the area that day and there was a break in routine, and this, this was really the key. They were distracted when they were intubating the patient. There, there were other folks uh, distracted with a bad IV at the same time, and they just put the stylet down on, on the bed. And there was, we came to realize that there was no organized timeout before entering the MRI to make sure that none of these MRI unsafe materials were still around. So we changed our procedure. We now have a timeout to mimic the universal protocol before proceeding into the magnet room. The MR techs are the effective ones who, who implement this. And um, as noted here, we uh, have this uh, a standard part of our procedure. And we put a dedicated box on the wall to receive the uh, stylet and the laryngoscope blade which can also have, as you well know, ferromagnetic components in them. Another incident we had is uh, very basic with, with a ferromagnetic eyeglasses case. I still have this on, on my desk. We use it for demonstrations with new techs. You can see the dent in the thing from uh, when it flew towards a 3T magnet. What happened is this glasses case containing glasses was 
in the hands of a, of a patient who it, the tech just slipped up and allowed the patient in the room with this glasses case in his hand. He got in the room and he put it down on the counter in the room. The tech just didn't see it, it just glitched. At the completion of, an exam, of the exam, the, the tech assistant walked in the room, saw the glasses case there, assumed it was safe because it was in the room. It hadn't flown yet. The, the assistant picked it up and started bringing it towards the patient, at which point it then decided to fly. It flew, the glasses broke, but thankfully didn't hit anybody in the meantime. So what we came to realize was, again, it, this is almost embarrassing. We didn't realize that, that we didn't have a dedicated place to put patient belongings right before they went in the room. We gown all our patients and such, and, but sometimes they're still holding on to that last stuff. So um, we have a dedicated box for them to put things in, and we are now working um, with ferromagnetic detection systems to try to keep these things down. No uh, discussion of projectiles is complete without having mops and such um, flying, and our shop is uh, not unique. Or, in, in that respect, uh, we had a mop fly into a magnet, and the uh, I, I talked to the the poor cleaning guy. Um, we realized after the fact that there was some metallic component, ferromagnetic component in this mop, and he uh, gave me the classic line that he assumed he could control it. Well, uh, he found out he couldn't, uh, particularly with the steep. Uh, um, magnetic gradient field when you get close to a magnet. So we replaced all our cleaning stuff in our MR facilities with MR safe things. And then here's a companion case that um, was anonymously uh, provided to us uh, in preparation for this talk, uh, titled The Very Eager Cleaning Woman. And uh, in this facility, there was the, the typical cleaning of uh, magnet rooms in the past with people, technologists involved and such with, with non-magnetic uh, implements. But there was a new situation which the department did get a new uh, cleaning or a uh, floor buffer and such. And for whatever reason, the person with the floor buffer did make it into zone four into the magnet room. And what's depicted here and what was given me was that you can see that there's a solid line here, at which point, as the buffer is going into the room, the buffer is continuing to work, but where the lines became dotted, the buffer evidently started making funny noises and became airborne and flew around the magnet and into the bore. And you can see here again, it's been discussed, the very steep spatial magnetic gradient as you're close to the magnet which can be very deceiving because it, it ramps up uh, the strength of the magnetic pull very much. And here's the pictures of, of the buffer in the magnet. And uh, so there was all sorts of damage. The magnet was down. And the thing, the lessons learned from this is that what's so important is to demonstrate to people who have reason to be in there, <clears throat> to demonstrate the forces and we do this a lot with, with our people. We use a uh, steel wool ball that we wrap in duct tape. And that is very effective. It's, it doesn't have much ferromagnetic mass, but to just get that sense of pull and then just let people play with it in, in the magnet room really makes a, a great impression uh, with our folks. And then obviously um, be supervising in these situations. We had a potential incident. This, this is now several years past, but we came in one Monday morning to find a ferromagnetic oxygen tank just standing by its lonesome about 12, 15 feet away from the, the zone four door. And this, uh, this got our attention big time. And we realized that uh, there had been an anesthesia case over the weekend and of course, Things when you see something like this, you're reminded of the, the tragic death of Michael Columbini and such, also as a result of a ferromagnetic oxygen tank. So we discovered this tank and we realized once again, this is one of these one-offs. There had been an anesthesia case late on Sunday night over the weekend. The regular personnel were not there and this tank was just left. Well, we used this 
at, to our advantage to get some people to listen to us. That number one, we need to improve our education of our anesthesia colleagues who left that thing there. Let anybody who sees such a thing stop the line. And then we really use this as, as our way to get our foot in the door to say, we got to get these ferromagnetic oxygen tanks out of our shop, which is uh, Mayo Clinic. And so we, we got the administration's ear and we were able to get this through. The, the kicker is, is that the carts have to be adapted if you go to aluminum tanks. They're three-eighths of an inch different in diameter, which is not an insignificant thing. But you can sell it on the ergonomic benefits that the aluminum tanks are much lighter. And so nursing and such loved it, and that helped us get buy-in. So now we've gotten, by and large, the ferromagnetic tanks out of our place. A recent event um, was just given to me from um, an, an anonymous site. And they had an incident with a ferromagnetic lift bar when they were bringing a patient down to MRI from the floor. These are one of these lifts to lift them off the bed and get them onto a cart to get them down to MRI. So with the sling, they detached when they moved the patient this ferromagnetic bar. And the bar was hidden under the sheets on the bed and they actually moved the patient over um, from the transport cart onto the MRI table and started moving the patient into the, into the magnet, at which time this ferromagnetic bar attracted up towards the magnet and pinned the patient's legs against the bore. Thankfully, there was no reported injury that I heard about. Um, but again, that, that got everyone uh, that got their attention up for sure. And so what they did at their place was that they went back to the clinical areas and made darn sure that they knew when they were sending a patient down to MRI to leave that bar on the, on the sling device, don't bring it down. And they actually constructed caps on the apparatus to prevent that bar from being detached. And then down in MRI, they looked very carefully at their visual screening process. And they're looking into using the handheld ferromagnetic detectors on those patients uh, coming down from the floor before going into the MRI. And uh, I think there's a lot of um, interest and a lot of sites to use these uh, more heavily. Now moving a little bit into the realm of uh, you can't make this stuff up, um, we had an, an accidental quench. Um, again, this is, uh, you know, you could work for years and years and never have anything like this happen. But, but what happened here was uh, we were, the royal we, we were preparing for an anesthesia case and the anesthesiologist was getting ready before the patient was in the room at all. And he's bringing his anesthesia machine into the room and just very fixated on getting it in the room. One thing he didn't realize was the height of the anesthesia machine relative to the quench button on the wall. And again, you can't make this stuff up. And so he's pushing his anesthesia machine into the room right next to this button. And the whip of this thing caught that, flipped that little door over it up and hit the infamous red button, at which time there was a quench venting the 1,800 liters of helium out in the street. We actually had an alert radiologist out on the street who whipped out his iPhone and uh, got this actually on video of all this expensive helium venting out at the side of Mayo Clinic. And um, so anyway, to make a long story short, a little comedic relief here, um, we got a very cheap fix for a very expensive problem here and just covered these uh, quench buttons with a plexiglass shield so that we can always rip this off, it's Velcro attached, but to give a little bit more protection for that button. Now moving into the patient care realm, we had an incident with a sedated patient elopement or leaving the facility. And this, this actually became a, a pretty big deal institutionally in that, um, you know, I'm sure like a lot of sites, we uh, sedate a lot of patients before MRI, a lot of minimal sedation with just Ativan. 
but we're a little sensitized in Minnesota because there was an, an incident uh, about 10 years ago where a, a patient had been sedated for a procedure and left and was in a car accident and killed very shortly after leaving the hospital. And so we instruct all our patients that if they are going to get sedated, we will not give them sedation generally if they do not have a driver with them or a responsible adult. So what happened here in this instance is that a brain tumor patient came in. You can see some post-op change over here. And he got some oral sedation for his exam. And we got through the MR, and he was dismissed. And he goes out into the, into the patient lobby. And his, his wife was out there. And it was just like ships in the night. He just walked right past her, walked out the door, and just kept walking down the road. And he was found by the police about a half a mile away from, uh, from the facility. Thankfully, he wasn't harmed when he was out. But what we realized when we went back on this thing was that we had no reliable way heretofore to identify our sedated patients. We did not have a process in place to hand them off to their responsible adult. So what we've done, we've got a wristband now that any patient who gets sedated, um, just, just with Ativan, they need to be seen by a nurse before uh, we'll let them go. And they get directly handed off and signed off to that named individual. There's also this one institution-wide that if for some reason that a patient uh, needs sedation and they don't have a responsible adult, uh, there's a whole process in place. It's called the ticket and ride process to get them a cab, get them to where they need to be, um, and hooked up with somebody responsible. Moving on to other patient care events uh, related to the foil-backed medication patches. As you know, um, these are out there, and some of them have the foil backs that can be a risk in the MR environment because the foil uh, could at least uh, theoretically um, pose a risk of burns. So we have to be very cognizant of the presence that some of these patches can have foil in them. A lot of the medications delivered by these uh, foil patches are ones that the patient wouldn't really suffer if you remove them, at least in the short term, with the very notable exception of clonidine. Clonidine um, is an antihypertensive medication that critically ill patients often are on. And we had an event. This did not happen. We did not get the hypertensive bleed, but that's to get attention. Um, that, uh, uh, as said, the, the foil back pat uh, patches can cause heating. But what you need is uh, clear handoff communication because what we had happened was a patient came down to MRI, had one of these clonidine patches. The technologist took it off and called the floor and told them that it was off. The patient went back up to the floor, and somewhere in there, there's some hand waving here, the, the word did not get across from the technologist to the, the people who needed to know. Patient was up on the floor and the blood pressure was skyrocketing. And it wasn't for hours until someone finally figured out that the clonidine patch was off. And so what we realized, and I think Ann Sawyer said it earlier, that technologists really should not be in the business of discontinuing medications and, and documenting that. So we've, we've handed that all over to our nurses because they're much better at documenting and getting the communication uh, pathways in place uh, to, to get a clear communication pathway to the people that need it. Another issue that we had was related to prisoners and being Ferris free. Um, we have a large federal um, medical center. It's a euphemism for a... Uh, uh, a medical prison in Rochester. There are some high-profile prisoners there, I can tell you. And, um, but, and they often come in for their MRIs. And wouldn't you know, we had one of these prisoners there when the Joint Commission was there last year. And once again, you can't make this stuff up. Our techs have known heretofore that when um, a 
prisoners there and with the guards that you have to have at least one of the guards ferris free in case the prisoner starts really acting up in the uh, in the magnet room well it just so happened just as the joint commission guy is going through mr right there we had a new technologist who didn't quite get that point and um one of the the guard or i'm sorry both of the guards were not entirely ferris free so we actually got a requirement for improvement and such and so um this is just a cautionary note to you to to make sure that one of the guards is is totally ferris free and ready to go if need be and we had to go through a whole uh corrective action as it were with the joint commission but uh, that's behind us now thankfully now this is truly in the realm of you can't make this stuff up um you know things like city unsure why the sewer smells and attorneys suing themselves and such but we have a a brand new facility in rochester a new proton beam building and the patients are first going on it just in in the last couple weeks and it's this beautiful facility and we have an mri over there for therapy planning purposes and one thing we realized was that most of all of our other sites without exclusion we have magnets paired up next to each other in, in sites like this like we call this the bowling alley where everyone is is next to one another well this one magnet here out in the proton beam facility is out there all by itself in a separate building which is is different than our typical model so what happened here was that some protocol development scans were going on in that new proton beam magnet and the decision was made by some of the folks to get an early start on our acr accreditation of the magnet and that would require a uh, contrast enhanced exam so that the building wasn't open formally yet but a, a patient was a clinical patient was brought over for a contrast enhanced exam and this is one of these things that's so patently clear after the fact but uh, it's uh, we didn't pick up on it at the time this first patient at this facility the first patient that got contrast had a severe contrast reaction and actually had laryngeal edema and uh, was was in a bad way and um, had to be treated with with epinephrine and such and when this was all going down we realized that there was all sorts of problems here that we hadn't thought through we were in a new building the code team didn't even really know how to get there when they were called some of the access points in the building were locked we found that the code cart was down the hall a bit we really didn't have it together so this is just a, a cautionary note it took a while to find the blood pressure cuff and the stethoscope thankfully the contrast reaction box was there so this this is just in the last week that uh, we're now at the point now of doing contrast and en en enhanced exams there and we now have a checklist and we ran a mock code uh, and got everybody there made sure that everything works and uh, went through a mock code with with our dummy and such and uh, we did feel confident that we had everything uh, uh, teed up going forth from that point but again that's that's just say uh, it was a wake-up call to us to realize that you really need to uh, have everything together going in here so uh, next is a uh, anonymous site and uh, a burn was uh, occurred at another site and this has been alluded to a bit in this session today that um, this patient was under anesthesia the the lesion wasn't uh, discovered until after the exam everything checked out on the magnet and the only thing that can be suspected is that there was a small gap between the patient and the scanner bore that concentrated the current um, against the bore causing the burn the pads have since been replaced and it just reinforces the need to be especially careful when patients are repositioned in the scanner when they're under anesthesia 
and you need to be uh, very careful for looping of leads with monitoring devices and scan in, in the normal mode. Now, to wind up on some things related to devices, um, we have had s some issues with that. We had a near miss with a patient with an abandoned pacemaker lead. Uh, this story is a little bit convoluted. The patient uh, was a pacemaker patient. He presented with myelopathy. He was scanned with pacemaker precautions. We found a thoracic meningioma. The meningioma was resected, and at, at about the same time, they decided they didn't need the pacemaker anymore. So the pulse generator was explanted and the lead remained. Now the patient comes back to us for a follow-up exam to look at that thoracic cord. And when he comes to MRI, he's asked the question, do you have a pacemaker? No. So he checks no. And what happened is the patient made it almost to our scanner. It was caught right at, at the last instant, but there was no note in the order that the patient had a retained lead. The MRI safety form didn't I inquire about retained leads. The patient didn't disclose that he had the lead present, and our prior report hadn't mentioned that the exam had been conducted with pacemaker precautions. So here's this retained lead without the pulse generator, and this, like I say, was thankfully caught at the last instant, and then we went on, on a rescheduled exam to scan him with pacemaker precautions, showing a good result with that meningioma resection. And uh, our, our last speaker just, just mentioned uh, this, this paper, that retained leads could be conceivably very, very dangerous because uh, the uh, heating demonstrated here is for a retained lead not attached to a pulse generator. So patients with the retained meat leads may be even at greater risk of RF-induced da damage than ones that are attached to a uh, pacemaker pulse generator. So what we did with that, we've now changed our form to say, have you ever had a pacemaker in an effort to uh, catch these people? And then finally, um, we've been trying to get a handle on keeping a good record in the electronic medical record of what's implanted in our devices. I think we can make every case that that's as important as allergies and medication reconciliation. So just to plant that seed. We had another similar event with a patient with a, um, one of these pill cams. The patient, as you know, um, these are MRI unsafe. The patient was transferred from a hospital service A to hospital service B, and neither service knew, uh, or service B, I'm sorry, or the patient knew that they had this device in them. They got down to MRI, and we saw this tremendous blowout and realized uh, after the fact, when this was all reconstructed, that the pill cam had not exited this patient. So um, we're exploring a wristband solution with this. And once again, this whole notion of getting something in the electronic medical record about our implanted devices. We had an event. There was a question uh, related to this uh, just before that uh, got started here about a deep brain stimulator. There are very specific conditions necessary to scan a, a deep brain stimulator um, safely. You need a TR head coil, physicist present, and you gotta keep the SAR way down at 0.1 watts per kilogram. Otherwise, you can get heating. There's been an unfortunate incident elsewhere where a lumbar spine using a body transmit uh, was performed and caused the burn in the brain. So when we look at our processes for how we screen for unsafe devices, the order set asks about are there any MRI safe devices, unsafe devices. I mean, the radiologist looks at the electronic medical record. We have a screening form and the tech does a verbal screening. So on the order set, does the patient have any of these? And this exam happened to be pre-ordered. And so, as it turned out, it came across as no MRI unsafe devices present in this patient with a deep brain stimulator. And we found that the safety questions were not asked carefully at, at the time of the order. Strike one. Now, the patient comes to us in MRI, and the doc has, has dictated a note on this patient, 
but the note is still in dictation and the radiologist doesn't have the information that there's a DBS there, strike two. Now you'd think you get to the MRI safety form and of course the patient's gonna disclose, I have a deep brain stimulator. Well, the patient gets to us and the, the safety form says, no, 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 all down the line, anything. But the only thing that is said is the Sante study. Our technologists did not follow up on what that is. That's actually the clinical trial for uh, control of temporal lobe epilepsy with deep brain stimulators. But our tech, unfortunately, did not follow up on that one little piece of information. Strike three. Now the tech, you'd think all the verbal screening questions would have caught it. He went through all of these. The patient denied having anything. Strike four. So now the patient, we, we put the patient on with a body transmit and get this call after the fact that we just scanned the patient with a deep brain stimulator at 3T. And thankfully, that's all I can say, there was, there was no injury to the patient such as uh, we can see that happened in the other patient. We actually brought the patient back, scanned them out at the hospital like we typically scan these patients with all the safety precautions and showed that there was no edema or anything around those leads. But what it does show is this patient was losing or had lost a lot of her left frontal lobe and it just begs the question, how reliable is the patient? And because we're using them as the, the final word on, on what's in them. So what we did, we improved our education. We can't permit any ambiguity on the screening form. We have things in place now to um, give more patient uh, education and such. And then finally, we've been implementing an implanted devices module, finally in our electronic medical record. And that's now getting through in a way that we can now get a good handle on what's implanted in our patients. And it, it uh, flags patients um, in our schedule. It, it gives us alerts for um, what we need to know. And then the last, um, case just very briefly, just in the last couple months while this was going in, we ended up getting a patient on the table and it was caught early, but we did start scanning a patient with a spinal cord stimulator that once again, the Swiss cheese aligned and this patient slipped through, as you can imagine, because you know the scenario now. It was ordered as no MRI unsafe devices, even though this patient had a spinal cord stimulator. Now here's what the patient wrote on his safety screening form. He has an implanted cardiac loop recorder. He wrote monitor heart and that's all he disclosed to our technologist that he had in. And we use the ferromagnetic detectors and have our patients go past them. This patient as it turned out, who is not pictured here, had a very bad back, so we did not bring him past the ferromagnetic detector as we do like this patient here, I'm uh, showing as an example, a patient with tissue expanders where the ferromagnetic detector goes through the roof showing red. So this patient gets on our scanner and he start, our tech starts scanning and picks up on the fact that there are these uh, spinal cord stimulator leads heading up and so Thankfully, we don't think this will happen again because this is now flagged in the system in uh, the implanted devices module. So in conclusion, a robust event reporting system, root cause analysis of MRI safety events and engagement of staff in solutions and practice improvements can lead to incremental improvements in MR safety. And I always find it very helpful to share events between institutions because we're all trying to improve MR safety for the entire community. And with that, I'll quit and thank you for your attention.